I've been worried about the last day and a half. If you follow me on Instagram, you know, I'm worried that stirrup pants are coming back in fashion. Okay, if you're over the age of 35, you're worried too, and you're a female. If you are under the age of 35, learn from your elders. You will look back at your pictures and ask yourself, why? Why did we do that? Not really, okay? That's not really what I'm worried about. Jesus says, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Recently, I sent a text to a friend that I hadn't been together with in quite some time. And I sent her a text and I said, hey, you want to grab lunch sometime and catch up? And I didn't hear back from her that day or a couple days passed. And all of a sudden I thought, oh, you know what? I didn't hear back from her. And it didn't worry me at all because this is how I operate too. Like I see a text like that, I think, oh yeah, I do want to do that. And then I get busy and I don't text back. So it didn't bother me even in the least. So he sent another text and he said, hey, I didn't hear from you. Do you want to get together? And her immediate reply was, I'm going to be busy for the next couple of months with work. Now my thoughts started. So here's what I did. I first went through all our previous text messages. Like, did I do something? Did I miss something? Did she ask me something and I wasn't there? Didn't see anything. So then I started creeping on all her social media. And I started looking like, did something happen that everybody else responded to and I didn't respond? Did I do something wrong? Nothing. So then my mind really started. Then it started saying, Rochelle, you know yourself. You're so blunt sometimes and you hurt people's feelings and you don't even know. You probably screwed this up. Think. So I'm thinking like, what did I do? What was our last conversation? When was our last interaction? Then I started making up that, great, there goes another friendship. Why are you a pastor's wife? <laughs> Truth, this is how my mind works. A couple days later, she sent me a text and said, sorry, I was in the middle of a meeting. I'd love to get together. Want to get together in February? Have you ever brought your past, your made-up stories in your head into a situation and ruined a day, all for naught? In February of 2016, we were in a hard predicament. My dad was in the hospital in Champaign, Illinois, and he was at the last stages of lymphoma. The treatment had stopped working. His body was trying to fight. We all knew we were nearing the end. Also in February of 2016 was a cruise for Nate, Caden, Carter, and myself. It was a cruise I had won through work. It was a cruise that had been planned for over a year. And my dad was adamant that we were going on that cruise. I didn't want to go on the cruise. I wanted to stay home with my dad. But he said we were going. So we made all these arrangements for how we would communicate while we were on the cruise. And every day on the cruise, this is what my mind did. Well, this is probably the day they said it's the end. And they're not going to tell me because there's no way to helicopter off a boat. So I bet all my cousins and all my friends are there at my dad's bedside. I bet they're all saying their final goodbyes and they're all asking where Rochelle is. And they're like, well, that's spoiled child. She's off. She's an only child. She's off having a cruise while her dad's dying. I can just hear him. And you know what? If dad dies today, will we make it back for the funeral? Would they, they would hold it for us probably. And then the next day would start. And I would do the same thing all day long. Can you guess how great of company I was on the cruise? Do you guess what joy-filled, great mom I was on this vacation? Now, here's the end of the story. We got back. My father went to heaven on March 8th. I had plenty of time. I was there with him. Have you ever 
borrowed the worry of tomorrow and ruined today? Have you ever let your spiral thinking actually affect the people you're around to the point of negativity? Jesus says it very simply. He says, I tell you, don't worry about your life. Don't worry about what you're going to eat or drink. Don't worry about your body. Don't worry about your diet. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet God feeds them. Aren't you much more valuable than them? Can one of you, this is the line that gets me every time when I read this from Jesus. Can one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about all this stuff? And then he says, down later, he says, for even the people who don't believe in God run after these things. And your heavenly father knows that you need them. So seek him first. And don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow has enough worry of its own. Each day has so much trouble. Why borrow it? Jesus, great. <laughs> Love it, Jesus. How do we do it? It's so convicting when I read that. But it's hard to fix it. So a pastor that I watch really often and a licensed therapist. They're two different, from two different churches, two different realms of life. They follow them both on social media. They both compare the spiraling thoughts in our brain to a spiral staircase. One that we can take down and one that we can step up. And I love that visual. So today we're going to take a look at it. So here's this spiral. We have these thoughts that come into our brain. We can't control what thoughts come in. Sometimes it's news. Sometimes it's our kids. Sometimes it's our spouse. There's thoughts. And we can let them go and we can think about them more, right? And then becomes concern. And as you go down the thought spiral, the intensity increases. And it's healthy to have a concern. Like your child's running into the street. Concern. Right? That's healthy. I see the problem. I feel the problem. Uh, my blood pressure goes up. I feel the concern. God created us that way. It's healthy. And then I come up with a solution. I go grab my child's hand. Problem solved. At the top of the spiral, there's precision. We can label the problem and we can label the solutions, and they're almost always temporary. It's just today. I've got the concern, I label it, I come up with the solution. But then, as we go down the spiral, it gets a little bit harder. We get to worry. My favorite definition for worry is worry is the practice of praying to ourself. Let me say that again. Worry is the practice of praying to yourself. And you're thinking, that's not true. I don't pray to myself. This is the practice of letting thoughts go unlabeled, undisciplined, just around and around in your head. And you know what you're hoping for? We're all hoping for a solution. And you know where we're hoping for the solution to come from? Ourselves. This is our way of thinking, I'm God. Surely I'm smart enough to solve this problem that's overwhelming me. That's the practice of worry. And then there's overwhelm. Now we're nearing the bottom and there's so much more feeling coming in. That the physical overwhelm begins. And that's when we start to creep into anxiety Anxiety is when your body starts to protect you. And you might not want it to protect you, and you might not even know something's happening that you need protection from, but your body starts doing things like this. 
and you don't know why. Or you start to get a lump in your throat. Your mouth starts to get dry. And this is your body saying there's concern that's gone unnoticed by your brain. And you're not solving it. And so we're going to protect you. We're going to try to keep you from doing it. There's great news. In each of these steps, anxiety, overwhelm, worry, concern, thought, there are steps that we can individually take. We're going to look at them today. These are things that we can step and take and take progress towards better thought. Twelve years ago, I found myself doing this. I was standing in a place I had stood hundreds of times, if not thousands. The top drawer of my dishwasher, the rack, was open. It was clean. And I had the door open to the cupboard where I would place the clean glasses. And for the life of me, I could not make my hand pick up a glass and put it in the cupboard. I couldn't tell you why. I was fine. I'd had enough rest. I wasn't having babies. This wasn't the problem. See, at the bottom of the spiral, everything seems futile. So much so that you couldn't label a problem if you tried. You don't know what the problem is. You also couldn't come up with a solution if you tried. And this is what my licensed therapist friend calls either clinical anxiety or trauma, or in my case, complicated grief. And when you're at the bottom of that staircase with one of those, I'm just going to tell you today, it's like standing at the bottom of the staircase with 10,000 pound weights on each shoulder. And you need somebody to come alongside you and help take those off before you can start to take the steps up. And so I want to be very clear as we go forward today, We're going to talk about worry. We're going to talk about things that God helps us. But if you're in that place of clinical anxiety, trauma, complicated grief, we're going to ask you, please seek out a therapist. Please seek someone that can help you so you can start to do that spiral up. In every situation in life, whether it's pride, anger, lust, worry, we are creatures of habit. And we have our part. And we have God's part. And I think where the confusion comes in and the frustration is that we confuse the roles. We want God to do our part. And we want to do God's part. And one of my fears today is that as we get into this message that I think we can all relate to or we have somebody in our life that relates to this is you're going to be waiting for me to give you something inspirational and miraculous that's going to fix it. And I don't have that today. What I do have is a lot of work. Because God gives us an answer of what to do in this spiral staircase, but it's a lot of work. And so at the end of today, I'm going to ask you to put in the work in one of two places. I'm going to ask you to put in the work to progress in your own thought spiral. Or... I'm going to ask you to put in the work to understand and be more empathetic to the people around you that are in that thought spiral. Because that's what God calls us to do. So here's a picture of our brain. Two very important parts, the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. The amygdala is the place where we feel things. It says, oh my gosh, your child's going into the road, ah, 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 blood pressure up, I feel, I feel, I feel. Your prefrontal cortex is where it says the solution is grab their hand, get them out of the road. We all know people that use only their prefrontal cortex. They are logical, they don't understand why you are thinking that way, they don't understand why you are being emotional, and we also know people that only feel, 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 I feel, I feel, I feel, okay? 
Here's the interesting part. God made us with both parts of our brain, and when they're working in conjunction, and when we're healthy, this is how God wants us to work. He wants us to be logical. When there's a concern, respond. So today, we're going to look at how our brains work. We're going to look at Jesus' words. We're going to look at the Bible and prayer and how all of that works together. Now, maybe you're here and you're not sure about your faith. You definitely wouldn't call yourself a Jesus follower, and you're not even sure if the Bible is true. I hope today will at least pique your interest into the thought that there is a God that is so powerful, so thoughtful, so loving, that he not only gave us a brain that will self-protect us, but he also gave us instructions through his word on how to reset our brain when that gets a little off. And maybe you're a faithful follower of Jesus, and you've been taught, or you made up a story in your own head, that if you struggle with anxiety, you're somehow disappointing God or somehow lack faith. No matter what your situation is today, I want to assure you that Jesus has words for us on this topic. And we have a man, a human, not Jesus, that lived with constant stress, constant pressure, and taught us a step-by-step direction on how to take steps up the spiral. So we're going to start there. In 2 Corinthians, Paul is writing to his friends, his other Jesus followers in the church of Corinth, and he says, we are hard-pressed on every side. Now, we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not in despair. We're persecuted. We're not abandoned. We're struck down, but we're not destroyed. He notices the harm. He's not letting it go. But he's saying there's hope. We have to equally look at the concern and the hope. And then what I love is he continues in this letter. And he says, as if he already knows what we're going to think today and what the Christians were thinking in Corinth. Great, Paul. Wonderful. You have no idea what my life is like. (laughs) So you can look at the hope. That's great. Jesus stopped you on the road. What about me? And so then he says, five times from the Jews, I received 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false believers. I've labored, I've toiled, I've gone without sleep, I've known hunger and thirst, and I've often gone without food. I've been cold, I've been naked. Besides everything else, I face, and get this, The daily pressure of my concern, of the stories I tell myself, of all the things I'm worried about, for all the other churches. You're weak? I'm weak. And he's saying, look, I get it. Life's hard. And there's not a day that goes by that we don't have something in our brain, in our real life, we're facing. He's saying, it's okay to not feel okay. That's life. This is next passage, though, is great. So he's going to give us a step-by-step how to step back up the spiral when all these things are happening. It's a life-changing, habit-breaking piece of scripture. If there's a piece of scripture I've relied on more in my life, I don't know one. This one that's coming. But it only works if you apply it. It does not work as just a song or just something you read. So we're going to look at when he writes to the church of Philippi and he tells people how to get out of the thought spiral. 
He says, now here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read the whole passage in one, and we're going to take the whole last 10 minutes today, and we're going to break it down piece by piece and look at how we apply it in our lives. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And so then he says, so, brothers, sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Think about those things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. Remember when I said, I don't have anything inspirational or miraculous. I only have work. Well, here we go. So the first piece of work is you're going to have to own it. You're going to have to agree that we don't get to control What gets our attention? The news, social media, our kids. We can only control what we let our mind focus on, and that's where the work comes in. How much are you willing to not be lazy in your thought, and how much are you willing to actually think about what you're thinking? So apply it. Number one, guard your mind and celebrate what's good. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. He's saying, celebrate. There is an author named Arthur Roach who wrote this phrase a hundred years ago. This is before we had pictures of the brain. This is before we knew how the brain worked. He wrote, worry is a thin stream of fear trickling through the mind. If encouraged, it cuts a channel into which all other thoughts are drained. He wrote that 100 years. Paul wrote this to-do list 2,000 years ago. And here's what neuroscience has learned in the last 50 years. In the last 50 years, they've proven that when you think about something one time, it makes a little pathway in your brain. When you think about something over and over, it makes a deeper pathway. When something is met with emotion, and you think about it, or something happens with great emotion, it creates a deeper pathway. It creates a channel. So I want to ask you, over the last 30 years, have you been building a channel of praise and a channel of thankfulness, or have you been building a channel of worry and negativity? Because here's what happens. Whatever channel we have, when we have a random thought, it gets caught in that channel. So we think, I've been worrying, I've been worrying, I've been worrying, I'm going to try to be grateful, and it's great. It gets caught in the channel. We have to repeat the thankfulness so many times for the worry to get caught in the thankfulness. It's called neuroplasticity, if you want to look it up in neuroscience. It's really interesting. And what I love is that science continues to prove God's word true. The further we get in science the more we understand that God's word has been true all along. Apply it, guard your mind, celebrate what's good. What do we do next? We still guard our mind, and we have to catch and change our thoughts quickly. So he says, you know, think about what's true, what's noble, what's right. This licensed therapist that I follow, I love it. She has a statement for this, and she calls catch it and label it. Catch it and label it. And then she says, make it better but believable. Let me give you an example. Your loved one is late. They're about 15 minutes late. They haven't called. Does your mind immediately go to a car accident? They got killed. Somebody murdered them. That's a 2% chance. 98% chance is somebody caught them going out the door. Somebody's chatting with them. They're stuck in traffic. So here's what a non-worrier loves to tell a worrier. Oh, stop it. That didn't happen. That is not helpful. 
okay? So we want to do better but believable. So if your mind immediately goes, my, my loved one's 15 minutes late, I bet they're dead. You go, you know what's more believable is that they're in traffic or that this happened. And so you just repeat that to yourself so that that better but believable is creating a new pathway, a new way for you to think. Paul says it like this. Don't think about the bad things. Think about what's true, what's praiseworthy. Apply it. Ask for help and offer real help. This is interesting. This is a scripture about Aphrodite. Um, Paul has had Aphrodite there with him, and he says, I'm going to send him back to you because you guys are worried about him. And when some, and he's worried. He's really worried about the church. And he's like, it's better for you to be in community than to worry alone. And so if you know that you struggle with your thoughts, if you know that the longer that you're alone and the more that you spiral, you need to get in community and you maybe need to get a therapist. There's nothing wrong with that. And if you don't struggle with worry, this isn't a big one for me. Don't diminish the people that do by saying, it'll be okay. Like, let's say that you have a student that is a worrier, and they're like, I'm really worried I'm going to fail my test. You're not going to fail. You don't know that. Don't diminish. Better, but believable. I bet all of that studying is going to pay off. Much better than negating the worry. And then the other thing is encouraging. Have you ever noticed that the people who think about all the things are the most conscientious, kind, they'll never let you down type of people? Encourage that God made their brain different than yours and acknowledge it. Now, most of this message is helpful because we're all humans. And whether you believe in God or not, doing some of these tips and these tricks are going to help you out of that thought spiral. But I'm going to tell you something. If you aren't a follower of Jesus, I would invite you to become a follower of Jesus. Because the one way to release anxious thoughts and anxiety that will really work is through prayer. There's a recent study out that shows that if you pray for 12 minutes for eight weeks in a row, it actually changes the pathways in your brain. And it makes sense of the scripture that the peace of God transcends your thought. So the last thing that I have for you today is face it with God. We want to solve it ourselves in our own brain and be our own God. We want to command it out. But what we have to do is process it with God. We have to do the work and pray. Maybe you're in the place in your life where you're just unhappy. Maybe you're unsettled and you don't even know why or where to begin. Pray. Creating trust with God is not easy. The more you pray, the easier it'll be. The bigger the channel will be. You know, 2,000 years ago, nobody had seen the inside of a brain. And these words were written that tell us now how neuroscience creates pathways for the amygdala and the prefrontal, prefrontal cortex to work. God knew. And as, cra- as crazy as it feels to pray to somebody that you can't see or feel is as crazy as it would have been to tell somebody in the year 2000 that there are all these different parts of our brain that are firing synapses. You don't have to understand it for it to change your life. Now I want to end today with Jesus' words again. And this time I'm going to read them from the message version. If God gives such attention to the appearance of wildflowers, most of which you have never seen, don't you think he'll attend to you, take pride in you, do his best for you? What I'm trying to do here is get you to relax, not be so preoccupied with getting. 
so you can respond to God's giving. People who don't know God and the way he works fuss over all these things. But you both know God and how he works. Steep your life in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. Give your attention to what God is doing right now. And don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with the hard things that come up when the time comes. I love the message version on that. That's Matthew 6 if you want to go home and read it to yourself. And then Peter tells us, and I'm going to end on this message, on this verse. Don't cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. I promise, do the work. He'll change your life. He cares for you.